confidence that the Conservative Party's summer holiday is well and truly over. Because if you turn to the Daily Telegraph today, Boris Johnson has written a very powerful article indeed. Uh, within it, he makes uh, not just strong criticisms of Theresa May and the government, but he basically accuses them outright of giving away £40 billion in return for two-thirds of diddly squat. Boris, uh, very much on form. He talks about us going into battle with the white flag fluttering over our leading tank. And he basically says, look, the whole thing's rigged. Don't believe all this nonsense about there being a no deal. There is a deal. It's all been preordained. It's all been organised. And actually, we're going to finish up in many ways, and a point that David Davis had made on Sunday, we're going to finish up in pretty much a worse place than we were as EU members, the worst of all worlds. He does at some length talk about the Irish border. Now, those of you who've listened to me on LBC, I've made this point again and again and again. The idea there is no border today is utter nonsense because, of course, and Boris points this out very clearly. There are different education systems, different health systems, different excise duties on diesel, cigarettes, drink, uh, different uh, income tax rates, different corporation tax rates. Oh, I nearly forgot. There's a different currency as well. Uh, but Boris says uh, that, you know, not only is the idea that there would need to be a hard border, a total, an absolute myth. He says we're not going about this the right way. For every problem, writes Mr Johnson, there is a potential solution. Good, positive stuff. He says this government wanted essentially to stay in and create Brexit in name only. I can't think uh, of anything really stronger he could have said about the Prime Minister. He's outright accusing her of deceiving the British public and saying that Chequers is a total act of betrayal. He goes on to say we need to make a big, generous free trade deal offer to the European Union. And he says, at the end of the day, that actually the scandal is not that we have failed in these negotiations, it is that we have not even tried. So it looks like an outright naked bid for power by Boris Johnson. Much of what's been said in this article was, of course, said previously in his resignation speech back in July. Now, Theresa May's spokesperson has hit back hard, saying Boris Johnson has no new ideas. So let's just go back to Boris's resignation speech in July, where he highlights how he and David Davis came up with alternative solutions on Brexit, including the Northern Ireland border. When I and other colleagues and I single out my right honourable friend, the honourable member for Bryson Howden, uh, proposed further technical solutions to make customs and regulatory checks remotely. Those proposals were never even properly examined, as if such solutions had become intellectually undesirable in the context of the argument. And somehow, after the December joint report, whose backstop arrangement we were all told was entirely provisional, never to be invoked. It became taboo even to discuss technical fixes. So, Mr Speaker, after 18 months of stealthy retreat, we have come from the bright certainties of Lancaster House to the, the Chequers Agreement. And you put them side by side. Lancaster House said laws will once again be made in Westminster. Yeah. Chequers says there will be an ongoing harmonisation with a common EU rulebook. Yeah. Lancaster House said it would be wrong to comply with EU rules and regulations without having a vote on what those rules and regulations are. Chequers now makes us rules takers. Lancaster House said we don't want anything that leaves us half in, half out. And we do not seek to hold on to bits of membership as we leave. Chequers says that we will remain in lockstep on goods and agri-foods and much more besides, with disputes ultimately adjudicated by the European Court of Justice. So that was Boris back in July, laying out the case, condemning Chequers, uh, but not wielding the knife, not saying this Prime Minister must go, not saying I'm the man to leave the country. Uh, something then, he was testing the water. What he's done today is in many ways a repeat of that, but the language is even stronger. So, you know, I wonder, 
I wonder, is Mrs May, is she feeling nervous? Is she feeling threatened by Boris Johnson? This was her response to an ITV News question last week on whether Boris posed a threat to her leadership. I was very pleased that Boris was my Foreign Secretary for the period that he was Foreign Secretary. But do you uh, think that he wants are... your job? I was pleased that Boris was Foreign Secretary for the period that he was Foreign Secretary. Would you what fight I'm him in a leadership focusing, election? Would you, stay, would you stay I'm, and fight him in a leadership election? I'm in this business for the long term because I want to deliver for the British people. So, do you think, as Boris fires the heavy artillery today, do you think Boris Johnson's intervention is helpful? If you think, like Theresa May and her team, there's nothing new from Boris, call 0345 973 Maybe you think, actually, we need to keep reminding this Prime Minister what Brexit was all about, and it's a good thing. Text to 84850. Or maybe you think, actually, what Boris needs to do is to really come up with a better, stronger, credible plan, in which case, tweet. using the hashtag Farage and LBC. And, of course, you can watch us on Facebook. Uh, I'm here in Adelaide, Australia, where it is an unearthly hour of the morning. Uh, and I'll tell you more about that as the hour goes on. So let's, let's get out there and find some opinions. What do people think? Has Boris been helpful? Or do you actually think he's being selfish? It's all about him. He just nakedly wants the leadership. What do you think? Derek is a new caller to this show from West Lothian. Derek, good evening. Good uh, evening, Nigel. So what do you make of Boris today? Well, I agree with your last point. I mean, I, I, I don't trust Boris Johnson to deliver a clean Brexit any more than I trust Theresa May because... Don't you? He, well, shortly before he joined the referendum campaign, he said, he said himself that he'd been having the for a long time about which side to come down on, you know, leave or remain. And that, yeah. that doesn't sound to me particularly principled, you know. It, it's, it, it's, I wouldn't be surprised if he just tossed a coin, you know. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Derek, I mean, I was, I was obviously at that moment in time, you know, desperately wanting for some conservative figures and some Labour figures to kind of break ranks with their parties and go for the Leave vote. Kind of my nightmare at the start of 2016 was, well, what if it's just me? You know, we get 43%, but we still lose. I was pleased that Boris made that decision. Do you not think, Derek, it's possible that... Boris hummed and hard, spent a very long time making his mind up, but that actually now, if you listen to him, and if you read his article in today's Telegraph, that maybe now, Derek, he actually genuinely believes in it. Uh, poss possibly, but I mean, you, you might think that listening to Theresa May, but we all know she doesn't believe in it. You know, I, I think he probably is more genuine than Theresa May, but, yeah. you know, he has, throughout his career... No, I don't mean necessarily recently, but you said some very positive things about the EU, and not like you, who's, I mean, you've always been against it, right from the start. I've always been totally against it, Derek. Yeah. Yes, that's absolutely right. But, uh, Derek, do you think that what Boris is doing here is trying to unseat Mrs May dramatically at the Conservative Party conference? Uh, I think probably. I think his main... I think... He, I get the feeling his, his main... I'm not saying he's not genuine now about Brexit, but I think his main motivation is to be Prime Minister. Yes, I know. And he's using Brexit. I'm not saying he's not genuine right now. Maybe he is, but... No, I get the point. ...using it rather than, like yourself, genuinely believing in it. So, regardless, so you know. is today's intervention helpful or is it outright selfish? Um probably a bit of both <laughs> okay all right derek many thanks indeed for your call let's go to les in birmingham another new caller to this show les good evening oh very good evening Nigel. yeah pleasure to talk to you pleasure uh, to talk to you so is it a constructive <laughs> and helpful thing that boris has done with this article um no i don't i i, I agree with uh, virtually everything the last caller says uh, yep. boris comes to be comes across to me as uh, somebody that jumps on the bandwagon um, of, of whichever is the most popular, uh, a bit like the Sun newspaper, that you expect the Sun newspaper to do that and not a prospective leader, leader of the country. Um, I, 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 the other thing you should bear in mind, of course, Nigel, is that he could have become leader of the Conservatives and subsequently Prime Minister uh, a few days after the referendum result was announced. Yeah, he and then Michael favorite, Gove, of course. He, he refused to put his hat in the ring. Uh, uh, he kept very quiet. I think he was absolutely shocked that he, and you, of course, um, uh, you know, he, he uh, uh, and others had won. I think he was 
totally, uh, I think he didn't expect it and, and he didn't know what to do and, and he was very quiet. Um, and and when Theresa, Theresa May was on the path, of course, she, she got in without anybody uh, fighting against her. Um, and so, yep. you know, now, now Boris is... Well, I mean, he made a mess of that, didn't he? Because, because he not, only did, not only did Michael Gove withdraw his support, but if you remember, he was supposed mm -hmm. to ring Andrea Leadsom on the Saturday night before about 6 p.m. to confirm that his name was going forward for the leadership and he was playing cricket and he forgot to ring her so she put her own hat in the ring for the leadership. I mean he made an absolute mess of all of it but do you think Les, I mean are you a Brexiteer Les? I, I, I'm still sat on the fence Nigel, I've never heard one argument uh, of any substance in favour of going either way so I, I'm waiting to hear. You're still waiting to hit. No, fight. well, look, okay. uh, it is a great debate. It is a huge divide. Uh, but clearly, Les, you think, you basically think that Boris Johnson is a cynical career politician, don't you? I think he likes to be in the limelight. I think he loves every minute of it. I think he was a great <laughs> well, well, I, I think he was a great leader uh, of the GLC or whatever it's called nowadays. Um, uh, uh, you know, his time in London. But London, he was London mayor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. GLA. I, I, yeah. Les, I, I, Les, listen. I, you know, I've got the point. Absolutely. Your texts and tweets coming through. Sorry. Why do we even need a deal? Why don't we just leave? Now, fascinatingly, some overnight polling from LBC, which we'll go through in this programme, showing that a very large number now of Brexiteers want Brexit, even if you tell them there'll be a recession, even if you tell them the queues at Dover could go on for hours. A large number of Brexiteers are saying what that text just said. They're saying, isn't it time we simply left? It's time now for the news. So as, as Boris fires those big guns at Theresa May and the government, is this intervention helpful? That's the question I'm asking you. <laughs> I have to say, I think what he wrote about Northern Ireland, and did so at length, was helpful. You know, he basically laying out that the government are not looking for solutions, because actually the civil service that are driving this process want to keep us as closely tied to the European Union as they possibly can. Is he offering a plan? Is he offering an alternative? Well, he does say, at the end of the article, that what he wants us to do, and I completely agree with this, is to make one big generous free trade offer. Uh, he says he wants an intimate partnership on foreign policy justice and all the rest. Uh, he wants us to go back to the principles that Theresa May laid out at Lancaster House. I think at some point, Boris, you're going to have to talk about if this logical big free trade deal, which is very much in the interest, of course, of the European Union and the German car manufacturers and the French wine producers, but if this gets refused, because they just cannot bring themselves to see a good deal with the UK for fear that others may follow, I think at some point, Boris, you're going to have to talk to us about the World Trade Organization rules. I think Boris needs to go further. My main criticism is he's clearly going for the Tory party leadership. He clearly wants to be the Prime Minister, but he should, and I have said this before, he should have absolutely gone for it back in July, because now, if she gets toppled at the Conservative Party conference, or in the run-up to it, and if there's a contested election for the leadership, and I can't see the backbenches just giving Boris Johnson a bye straight through to being Prime Minister, then weeks and weeks will be taken up with that contest at the absolutely crucial moment of our negotiations. We could finish up, if Boris brings down Theresa May, we could finish up actually making the deadline date for Article 50 of March the 29th a difficult one to meet, which is exactly what Mr Blair and Clegg and Soros and all the others want. I wish he'd done it earlier. As far as, as, far as the article's concerned, I like the style I do actually rather like the tone. Let's go to Edinburgh and speak to Owen. Owen, was Boris being helpful and constructive or just plain destructive and naked personal ambition? Hello? Hello? Owen, hello. Hi. Good evening. So, come on. Has Boris done the right thing? Um, he's done the right thing for himself, but I don't think he's done the right thing for the country or for the Brexit process, like much that Boris Johnson does. Um, I feel that his intervention was not only unhelpful, uh, it was irresponsible, and it brings us closer to a no-deal Brexit, which, of course, is something that would be in his interest, because no matter who takes over after that, they're going to be doing a better job than the government he left fall off a cliff from the EU.
But there is an argument, Owen, here, a logical argument, uh, that if you look at what Mrs May said at Lancaster House when I praised her to the rooftops um, on this programme for what she'd said, if you look at what was said out at Lancaster House and you then look at what was put forward with the Chequers deal, she has surrendered a huge amount of ground, hasn't she? I think reality is beginning to dawn on her. That, um, I, I don't think it's realistic. As you, uh, what you mentioned, a, a big free trade offer with the EU. I don't think it's yeah. realistic to, um, to, to have something like that and yet not compromise on any of the red lines that she's set out in Lancaster House. The EU is not going to risk the integrity of the single market. The EU is not going to risk the integrity of any of its institutions. Um, just to satisfy the UK with a with a trade deal, it, that might you but know it, it wouldn't be beneficial. But, but they've got a free trade deal, Owen. You know they they concluded a free trade deal with Canada. You know tariff free movement of goods with Canada. If they can do it with Canada, why not with us? They could absolutely do it with us, and the Canada Canada agreement would be a realistic one. But that's not the deal that the UK needs because that's a far 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 less um, less deep and less. Um, productive partnership than we already have with the EU. What, there isn't, there's been no argument from anyone so far as to what would replace the institutions, the legal frameworks, and the economic partnership that we currently have with the EU. Well, I mean, I mean my priority, as a lifelong Brexiteer, my priority is that we become an independent country. My priority is that we make our own laws. My priority is we control our own borders. My priority is we're not ruled over by the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg. And I'm afraid on all of those things, Chequers, I see Chequers as a betrayal, and I praise Boris at least for criticising it. I can see why you think that, um, but I, I think earlier you said that there's a poll that said that most Brexiteers now would be willing to take a hit to the economy and would be willing to take a, uh, take a hit to uh, you know, a lot of aspects of our, of our national life to deliver Brexit in the way that you say. But I think it's important to remember that neither you nor I necessarily represent the majority of people in the UK. No, we no. I, we don't want to see their country less influential on the global stage, and you don't want to see their politics thrown into complete disarray by a project which... Um, I, I think, think what people are saying, Owen, I, I think, Owen, what, you know, what people are saying in quite large numbers now is they don't believe Project Fear. It's now reached the level of cry wolf. We've had enough of being told we're going to be poorer. We've had enough of being told that plagues of black locusts may descend upon our land. We've just had enough, Owen, being told these things. Owen, I thank you. I've got to crack on. Go to James and Pinner, a new caller to this show. James, good evening. <laughs> Yeah, good evening, Nigel. Good to speak to you. You're doing a great job. Good to speak to you. <laughs> so, are you a Boris fan? Uh, well, I, I agree with the sentiments of what he said, but in terms of him as a uh, as a credible politician, I have my doubts. So, let me, mm. let me put it that way. I think what he yeah. has said has been said by people that have uh, a lot more uh, gravitas in terms of um, their specialities, you know, lawyers for Brexit and various other industry people have, have really set out that, um, you know, the whole Chequers proposal is really, um, you know, it's a farce. It doesn't deliver on most of what the uh, four key principles were for uh, the original referendum vote. So uh -huh. um, I, I actually believe that, um, I, don't think, I don't think Boris is making a, a leadership pitch. I actually think... You don't? Well, well, no, no. Okay. Not personally. Okay. Not, you see, the thing, is, the thing is with Boris, he is a very shrewd politician. You know as well as I do that he uses lobbying and back channels to really sort of set the, uh, set the position before he moves. And I, and I think, actually, he's too divisive a figure to uh, go into a, a, any sort of leadership competition with uh, Theresa May. I actually think it will be a proxy arrangement where I wouldn't be at all surprised if... Uh, Someone, if it ends up in a position like being Chancellor, but I actually think they need someone who is less uh, controversial as a leader. So it's going to be... Okay, so, 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 so James, James, when Boris writes, uh, of course I hope that the Prime Minister will still change course and rediscover the elan and dynamism of Lancaster House. So you think that actually what Boris is trying to do here is influence policy as opposed to go for the top job. I put it to you, James, you're in a very small minority of people that think like that today. Most people think it's a naked bid for the leadership. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't buy that. I, you look at what happened right. with uh, Michael Gove, you know, he backed off when he knew he wasn't going to win. And I think the same situation applies now.
Okay, nope, smashing. James, I thank you. Nigel, yes, the article is helpful because it highlights how Theresa May is selling Brexit down the river, says Laura from Shenfield in Essex. I don't really rate Boris as a politician, but let's face it, we have to have a Brexiteer in charge of Brexit. Here, here. And even my 10-month-old granddaughter could do a better job than the worse than useless Theresa May, or Theresa the appeaser, of course, as I tend to call her. Let's go to Bromley and talk to Luke. And, and so far, Luke, nobody so far I've spoken to says that Boris has done a good, constructive, helpful thing and that actually he should become the leader. What do you think? It's very useful. He should become the leader. Boris means Brexit. Should be the new slogan. Um, Boris he... means Brexit. I can see it on the... What do you put it on the side of a bus, do you think? <laughs> it should be. Plus it should be. I mean, they call it the checkers, checkers plan because it's basically checkmate that goes through to Europe. So, at the end of the day, Now's the time to get someone who believes in Brexit, to get a Brexit uh, cabinet to go, not a, a Remain cabinet. We need to, we need to get uh, Theresa May and her husband out of the cabinet, out, out of the uh, Prime Minister position. And hang, on, hang, hang, on, what, hang on, Luke, Luke, just one second. What on earth is wrong with Theresa May's husband? <laughs> he makes half the decisions. Do you think so? Of course, they've always had. It's just that she, they didn't want two politicians in position. He, he, he's quite, she quietly goes home and they talk about... So you that. think... So you think he's the guy putting the strings behind Theresa May? Well, she's a very, she's a very, she makes the decisions, of course, but uh, they, 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 they've never done anything separately. They've always stuck together, and uh, that's how it's always been. She, he's a businessman that worth three million quid together. It's fine, it's great, good. But at the end of the day, we have a, a Remainer in position who has yep. essentially, you know, he's got a cabinet who's, who's trying to do all they can to basically stand so look, I mean, again, checkers, because it involves writing a massive check to Europe, it's, it's, all, it's all too much. I say it's time that we get Boris in, Mog, hopefully you, maybe otherwise London Mayor. Let's do it, let's get some... Let's so get if there was in. to be, Luke, if there was to be a great bloodletting at the Tory conference in Birmingham at the end of this month, you think, let's just do it, let's get a new leader, whatever. I want my country back. I've heard that slogan somewhere before, Luke. I can't think who it was that coined it. So do I too, Luke. And I, I have to say, we'd have a lot more chance uh, of dealing with Brexit properly with Boris than we ever will with Theresa May. But why doesn't Boris just say it? If he wants to be the leader, why not just say it? You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It is now 6.30. And well, do we think Boris's intervention was helpful? Is it a naked bid for power? Is it right to call out the government... And that huge change in position from the Lancaster House speech to Chequers. That's what we're debating. Now, I'm actually in Adelaide uh, today, down under. I was in Perth yesterday. And I'm going on over the course of the next few days. I'm going to be in Brisbane. I'm going to be in Sydney. I'm going to be in Melbourne. And across to New Zealand, to Auckland. I'm giving a series of speeches here. I'm talking about Brexit, Trump, Italy, uh, the global revolution that started back in 2016. Um, Australian politics is absolutely fascinating. Uh, the Conservative Party in Australia is called the Liberal Party. Quite how they manage that, I don't know. And they are completely split. Just as we've seen the Tories split over Brexit, they're split over whether they should be a centrist party or whether they should be one with much stronger policies on immigration, uh, renewable energy, etc. So, big debates. And it's almost become a national sport here uh, to assassinate political Basically, Prime Ministers. Uh, Boris maybe could take a lesson uh, from Australia, how you get rid of PMs. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull went last week. Scott Morrison has taken over as Prime Minister. He is the seventh Prime Minister in the last 11 years. So, some big turbulence, some big chaos here in Australia. One of the interesting things, of course, has been the Australian attitude towards Brexit. A lot of people I've met, a lot of people coming to my talks in the evening, are people who say, well, Nigel, we're all in the Commonwealth. Uh, you know, surely there's some potential there. And certainly being here in Adelaide today, which, of course, is the wine-producing part of Australia, you know, we put big tariffs, big tariffs on Australian wine if we left the European Union properly, were freed and able to do a trade deal with Australia, they could sell us a lot more wine and we could buy wine a lot more cheaply. So there is potential. And, you know, I've been on the right-leaning 
programmes, radio, television, newspapers, and they all think Brexit is absolutely a great idea. But don't for a minute think uh, that I haven't actually had uh, some opposition. Here, for example, uh, was an interview I did with the 7 Plus Sunrise programme and their presenter, David Coke. Leaving the EU, sort of frankly, makes no sense, does it? It's, it's not in Britain's interests, and, and some of your arguments were just plain wrong. Well, the argument that we should be a, de that we should be a democracy, Who that we should are? vote for those... And, and, well, when 75% of your laws are made somewhere else, over which you have a very marginal influence, and where ultimately your Supreme Court is based in Luxembourg and not based in mm -hmm. London, you're not an independent country. You're actually, you know, a vassal state, a province of a new emerging European super state. Look, I fought against this thing for 25 years. We got the Brexit vote. I'm pleased to say now we've got rebel movements springing up right across Europe. Countries want to be friends with their neighbours, they want to trade with them, but not be governed by them. So I've not been given a clean run. Uh, you know, there are, there are clearly people here in Australia who think the EU is a good thing and the UK will be better off as a part of it. Overall, I would say, uh, of those I've met and the media stations I've talked to, um, quite a lot of them do understand the reasons behind Brexit. This, of course, is a sovereign country. It makes its own decisions, even if Australian domestic politics is even more chaos-ridden than British politics at the moment. Gosh, that takes some believing. Now, LBC commissioned a poll, uh, which was published overnight, uh, conducted by the firm Delta Poll, and it's really interesting. This poll was taking the temperature of Leave voters. How were they feeling? More Leavers believe Boris Johnson would deliver a real Brexit compared to Theresa May, 39%, to 30%. Also, and this is really interesting, Leavers are prepared to put up with the following if it means we actually leave the EU. 58% are happy to leave the EU, even if it means the NHS has to stop our medicines. More than half are happy to leave the EU, even if it means Britain going into a recession. More than half are happy, even if it meant the cost of food would rise significantly. Although I've just said with Australian wine, we could actually bring food and wine prices down. But hey, 70% are happy to leave the EU, even if it means longer queues at ports and airports. And 70% are happy to leave the EU, even if it means flights becoming a lot more expensive. Well... Isn't that fantastic, you know? And they're looking for full control of immigration and borders. That's what really matters to them. And it is fantastic because, and I mean that in the true sense of the word, because constantly, constantly, there are these negative headlines about what the impacts of Brexit could be. And when you present all the most negative scenarios, not that I believe them to be true, when you present even those to people, you know, a significant number of Brexiteers say, the hell with it, we just want to leave. And I think... What this reflects is we're just not believing Project Fear any more. Back to our callers. Was Boris's intervention helpful? Was it a naked bid for power? Does it do any good? Is he offering real, genuine alternatives? And Sam from Whetstone is a new caller to this show. Good evening, Sam. Uh, good evening, Nigel. Thank you for taking my call. Um, not a bit. I wanted, to, I wanted to ask you a question. They say that... Um, if there's a no deal, there'll be a gridlock around Dover and nobody will be able to move around uh, and we won't be able to get our, our goods across. But it will, it will, only be, it will not be one-sided. There will be a gridlock in Belgium and France. The people over there, the suppliers, want to get their goods over to us. So then we'll end up not paying the $40 billion, and it'll be like how uh, the, uh, Donald Trump and the Mexicans or, or Trump and the Canadians. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, and we'll save. Well, uh, we'll save forty billion in the bargain, and yep. uh, uh, and, and we'll have all the freedoms, as you say. We'll be an independent country. We'll not be governed seventy-five percent by 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 Luxembourg, and we'll have all the freedom, and we'll be more prosperous. Sam, you sound even more Eurosceptic than me. You've made the argument there very, very well. And, you know, the idea there'd be permanent gridlock at Dover, as you say, you know, the big, powerful European uh, producers, you know, who call the UK Treasure Island, 
because they sell us so much chocolate and wine and motor cars and all the rest of it. You know, in the end, economic logic in situations like this does prevail, even if there were short-term bumps in the road. But Sam, you know, go to Felix Stove, go to Southampton, look at the giant container vessels and boy some days i mean some of these got twenty thousand containers on them look at some of these ships coming into our country from dover they disembark they're on lorries they're heading off all over britain um you know even in a situation like that we only check a tiny percentage of goods that come in from china we have something called the trusted trader scheme sam i understand your argument do you think i mean given that you feel very strongly about this do you think it's time for boris to topple mrs may and try and take the crown himself well i think he's trying to protect the interests of the uk and as you said all these ports like felix Stowe and all they're all taking in uh, tons and tons of european goods they don't want them that to, they want don't want that to stop so it'll be a situation like what Trump does. You scratch my back, I'll scratch you. Yep, yeah, okay. And no, Sam, you, you, you've made the point beautifully. Thank you so much. Boris, I get by text, is our only hope for a full Brexit. Boris would make a much better leader. On Twitter, I can't decide which of Boris's many gaffes I struggle with the most. As a small business owner, I think my favourite now is when he recently said, stuff small business he used a stronger word than that actually but it's a bit early in the day yeah that's the sign of a good leader i get from somebody in brent nigel i think boris has done the right thing a hundred percent rosemary says any intervention is better than people just saying quiet and sitting on the fence the queues now for dover are hideous and we're in the eu bonnie you're right and what happens when the french fishermen have one of their regular blockades of the port and the ferries are delayed for hours and we're owed compensation because we're all members of the European Union. And, of course, we don't get a beam. Let's go to the heart of Europe, to Central Europe, to Slovakia, where David is the next caller. Hi, David. Hello, Nigel. Hi there. So, what do we make of Boris's intervention, David? Well, <laughs> to my mind... Um, Boris can posture as he likes, he can say what he likes. And, you know, what he said has all been good points. And his condemnation um, of what happened um, in the Prime Minister at Chequers is, is absolutely spot on. But what I'm interested in and what everybody else is interested in is what's he going to do? Yeah. Quite frankly... Well, I, 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 David, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, surely the moment... The moment to strike was back in July. We could now have just we, we could now just be finishing the Tory leadership contest, fit and ready to go off and see a suntan Monsieur Barnier back from the beaches of southern France. As it is, my real worry, David, is that if Boris succeeds in toppling the PM, and it's pretty clear to me that's his intention, uh, that we will we will end up spending the crucial months of the negotiation getting a new Tory leader. Um, yeah, either that or they're going to try and, you know, fiddle something to make some sort of extension. Um, at the end of the day, roll on the 29th of March, you know, UK law, we are out. Um, and between now and then, they, they can argue the cost of the one. We need to be out. Well, the WTO rule. well, no, but David, we do, and I agree with that. But David, I'll predict this. I'll predict this. There is going to be a battle royal that takes place in British politics this autumn. It won't just be a battle uh, that goes on within the Conservative Party. There'll be a huge debate going on in the Labour Party as well. You know, we had we had Labour for Leave on last week um, on this show, and they were pointing out that five million people who voted for Jeremy Corbyn had voted to leave. Uh, so there's going to be huge pressures uh, on both sides. But I see, David, I see a big establishment attempt over the course of this autumn to try to get that date that article 50 date of march the 29th suspended and that is going to be the battle this autumn and that's one of the reasons david why i am going back on the road how um how you're a skeptic now is your government in slovakia um quite uh, of course the members of the busy grad group and um yep. the very wary eye on brussels um to myself is victor urban's um hungry and um, you know as far as I'm concerned, you know, he's, he's making all the right moves. But I'd like to make one little side point. Based David, on I'm David. I'm gone. I'm done with time. I'm sorry. Do call again. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. It is now 6.46. 
I'm asking you, was Boris's overnight intervention helpful? Is this his big pitch, his big bid to become the Prime Minister? What interests me is I've not exactly been overwhelmed by messages and phone calls saying, good on you, Boris, you're the man that we need. A lot of you think, actually, he's behaving like a cynical politician and he's doing it for himself. I do get on Twitter, great, you're on at six now, says Mark. And Mark, I have to say, I'm very pleased to be on at six o'clock, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, rather than being on at seven o'clock. It's great. I'm looking forward to the new lineup. Mark on Facebook says, Boris is not a PM in my eyes. You see? Quite a lot of people saying that to me. Boris is not a PM, whilst Mog is. Well, Mark, I think it may be too early for Mog, but hey, let's see. Paul says, Boris pulled a late call, but better late than never. Well, I felt that during the referendum, you know, that he, he, he came to that late. Um, he did resign after checkers, albeit after a few days, but we're kind of... What we're getting today is kind of similar to the speech we got back in July, albeit the criticisms are a little bit fiercer. Andrea says the Tory Brexit shambles is falling apart. Time for Labour to vote it all down and bring on a general election. Andrea, let me, let me just tell you something. If the Labour Party completely go against what they said in their manifesto to the British people in June 2017 in the general election, they will start to lose huge numbers of vote too, votes too. This is not as straightforward for the Labour Party as many people seem to think. Nigel, what if you're wrong? Will you apologise to the country? Paddy, 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 how can I be wrong? How can it be wrong to want to be independent? How can it be wrong to want to live in a functioning democracy. How, I mean, look, come on, what price freedom, Paddy? We'll debate that another day, because today we're not talking about me, we're talking about Boris. I'm off to Belfast. Jim, a new caller to this show. Jim, Boris had a lot to say about the Northern Irish border. Nigel, pleasure to talk to you. Well, the interesting thing about Boris and the Irish border is that he's not considered the, du the DUP, which is propping up the Conservative government. So, and bearing in yep. mind that the, gov the government isn't sitting in Belfast at the moment, and it hasn't done, and we've got this, this awful situation. We've, we've now the, the, we've got the record for having the, you know, the longest... I know! You, you've <laughs> broken the record, haven't you? Bel Belgium was the country that had gone the longest without a government, and now Northern Ireland's just beaten it. it it's not a great record to have, Jim, really, is it? Correct. It, it's, it's absolutely horrendous, and there's so many things that just need sorting out, and, you know, education budgets can't be agreed. So it's hideous. So for me, he's a stalking horse. So between now and the 3rd of October, he will launch a leadership bid. And what staggers me is that having, you know, 14, 15 months, he's never laid out a completely clear vision. We're now getting little snippets of things that are coming out. But why isn't that? Because he hasn't actually put his manifest out. So to me, his manifest will come out in the next two or three months. And there's no way that this oh, week is going to get... Or weeks. Or weeks. It, well, it, four, it, four, four, four weeks. He'll no, do it. Sorry, yeah, yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you. He'll do it before the Tory party conference. But, I, but Jim, you mentioned the DUP, and, and I think you're right. We don't discuss this enough. There are 10 DUP uh, members, um, and they have been supporting and propping up this government. I mean, but I mean, the DUP don't want the return to a hard border, do they? Uh, no, and they don't want another general election because there's literally a few hundred votes between them and Sinn Féin. So, you know, for, for me, this whole thing, I think you're absolutely right. You said a lot of things about 20 past six that resonated with me. There's no way yeah. that this is going to be sorted out in the next six months. It is going to get extended, but Boris is going to... Oh, is going to oh launch no, don't, a, a, don't. A, 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 he's going to launch a leadership bid. I sat in three meetings with him, um, you know, as, 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 you know as, as part of something. He's a very, very yeah. clever, very articulate man. However, I do think he, he is only after this for his own personal ambitions. He definitely wants Jim, to get Prime Minister. Jim, you've worked with him. Jim, you've worked with him. I have worked with him only this. briefly, but, yep. Okay, let me ask you this. Is he capable of actually making a decision? Uh, on minor things, and this really was a minor thing, this was, this was to do with, with, with youth unemployment and youth training, uh, he was very, very good, and he, he grasped the nettle on it and put a, you know, a lot of effort behind it. This is when he was mayor um, of London, and you know, he put a lot of resources into making something very spectacular happen on the, on the world stage. Uh, it was yep. something called World Skills, and he could grasp that, but I really don't think that um, he's got the 
the, the where for all. Um, I don't think he's got the experience on the global stage, and I think, to be no, honest, it, foreign, it, foreign Jim, secretary, he Jim, made the right hash of it. Jim, I get this from so many people. People like Boris, they're amused by Boris. He is, by the way, a fantastic writer. I mean, today's article is, it, it's a great read, whether you agree with it or not. But does he quite have it? I'm not sure. Jim, thank you for your insight. On Twitter, I get, well, at least Boris is doing something here, Nigel, not jetting off around the world. Well, whoever you are, have a listen to this, right? I will be hitting the road on the 22nd of September this year with Leave Means Leave. My first big public event will be in Bolton. I'll be joined, and they haven't revealed their names yet, but I'll be joined by Conservative and Labour politicians. And I am, as soon as actually the show ends, going to start filling in my diary, and I will be tirelessly going around the country, not just to Conservative areas, but to Labour areas too, to get Leave voters, to let their MPs know in no uncertain terms that if they are betrayed on Brexit, they'll never vote for them again. Jacob Rees-Mogg for PM, not Boris. Boris is half-hearted. Also, Boris, didn't you want... Uh, well, well, look. Look, OK, this is another one, another long message saying Boris is in it for the glory. Come on, there must be someone out there that thinks Boris is our saviour. Maybe it's Andrew from Islington, a new caller to this show. Good evening, Andrew. Uh, good evening, Nigel. How are you? You right? <laughs> I'm very well and welcome. I have to say, no, that you're going to struggle to find anyone, I think, who's going to say that, uh, you know, Boris is the saviour. The thing is, obviously... I am struggling, yeah. He, he has the, the gift of the gab, and so does, uh, does Rhys Morgan. They are career politicians. He's very eloquent. His article is great in The Telegraph. If he does mm -hmm. come to power, do you think he's going to be actually able to deliver Brexit? It's, um, it's a power move. And when he does get into power, is he going to be able to deliver on it? And the thing is, I think that's the wrong question. I don't think we can deliver on it. I know you're saying that uh, um, half of Brexit voters are saying that, um, you know, uh, they would be willing to have a recession. I personally look at it the other way and say that that represents a quarter of the people that voted in the referendum, which is not representative. That's not democratic. It's undemocratic, if, if anything. So there's a few things I'd like to ask you, <laughs> Nigel. I mean, Andrew, 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 I know it's, 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 it's really funny because most talk shows, what happens is the hosts choose a subject and the public engage. And with me, it's the other way around. You all want to ring up and question me endlessly. Um, and we haven't got time, Andrew, today because we're actually running out of time. Andrew, thank you for your call. Thank you, all of you. Uh, for your calls uh, listen i don't mind one bit you coming on and asking me questions uh, but we need we do need folks to stick to the main theme each day it's been great you've been listening to the nigel farris show here on lbc i'm back tomorrow evening from six o'clock at ten tonight it's tom swarbrick but up next it's ian dale nigel thank you very much isn't it? it's all about face isn't it him handing over to me rather than the other way around but there we go